All right. I think we have sound now. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, so thanks for the heads up. <laughs> it should be working now. All right. Oh, there's still people saying no sound. Okay. Um, well, so let's see. Now, now sound. Okay. All right. Now we have the sound. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> what, uh, what a start to the stream tonight. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Hopefully, I, I spent a good part of the day today working on all the little gadgets and gadgets and things on here. So hopefully all the graphics and everything are working appropriately. And uh, let's start out with the first super chat of the night from Trashman, Trashman's intro. He says, live from real America, it's the lady who has never sold art for $75,000 a pop, nor hired child actors for fluff pieces, and most crucially, the D&D world wants to know how she makes her orc chops. <laughs> so here's Dolly. <laughs> oh, goodness, thank you, thank you. And we have, uh, thank you, Aaron Miller, for the donation as well. And I see we even have a couple of new members in the house. Uh, Mike Petty and Bruce the Boss Resurrected. So, um, both of you, if you're, uh, if you do the Discord and you sign up, if your name is different than what is, um, if your screen name on Discord is different than it is on YouTube, then send me an email or a message somewhere so that I can, or even tag me in the Discord, and uh, so I can make sure that you get into all the appropriate areas. So anyways, so let's see who is in the house. Uh, we have Bruce the Boss, of course. We have Shadow Bear, John Morgan, Squid Monkey, Irish Lover, Warhorse, Talisman, Andrew Kang, uh, Michael J., uh, Michael Tomlinson, Frank, Nomad, 0036, BS in California, Shadow Bear. Oh, it's so weird because there's all these different colors now. <laughs> uh, Frosty Leprechaun says it's coffee time. Me too. Me too. Man, I have no energy tonight. I'm not going to lie. Uh, we have Tony, Cap'n, Mac, Jonathan, Stevie, Gary Clark. Let's see, uh, let's scroll down some more. Michael Leslie, Matthew Dunn, River Hunters, BB37, John Thomas, Art Groat, God Key One, Bad Chev, Dave Simmons, Mark M, Daniel Nowland, Brett Johnson, uh, Rodolfo Valencia, Chris Russell, Daniel Noland, Tristan Goodrich, Jurassic Salt, with the little Jurassic Park avatar, I like it. <laughs> John Rayson, David Dole, uh, let's see, Matthew Dunn, Mike Sharp, Harry Stark, Tim Hazel, Ma Michael Slade, uh, 42 Chilled, Deleted Message, ooh, Elemental, John Thomas, Michael J, Jason J, Humongous, oh, I see what you did there, Gablin, Gamma, Goblin, Miller, Walter, Mick, Barson, Ken O, Gary Gwyman, John Thomas, uh, let's see, Lauren Garcia, Tim, just Tim, <laughs> Michael 9865Z, oh goodness, Zeger, Root, Rooter, I, mm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I know that I'm butchering that, Jack Longley, the her dark, or hair dark, perhaps, uh, Josh Pierce, Freebird0147, Ricky Hendricks, uh, Leonidas Alberia, we'll scroll down, we've got Dylan, we've got, I'll just say Sabby, because I'm not gonna run through that whole string of things. We have Glaxar for Kids in the house, and, oh, Eric Zalima says, let's go, Brandon! Oh, I wish there was a way for me to put this on the screen. Can I put this on the screen? I don't think that I can. Oh, I wish there was a way. I think that's only a StreamYard thing. And uh, we, don't, we don't use that here anymore. 
<laughs> uh, Bruce the Boss says, I feel like I've been a member for a year now, but glad to make it official today. Love your community. Thank you. Uh, we're pretty active in the Discord, actually. Um, usually with random crap. <laughs> But, you know, we've got a breaking news section, we've got some memes going, we've got people talking about TV shows, video games, books. We have a special spot for Boomer Help, a.k.a. helping me out with things. So, uh, <laughs> and Bruce the Boss, Bruce, Bruce the Boss also says, blame Brandon for the sound. Um, and David says that I'm very faint tonight. Hmm. Well, I don't really know why that would be, because, I mean, the microphone really cannot get any closer to me at all. So, I'm not really sure what that's about. Hmm. Is, uh, are other people having that as well, that the volume is really low? I know that Q had said something about it before, and so I tried to mess with the settings. But, uh, literally, the, the mic cannot be any closer than it is right now. And, oh, did things freeze? Okay. All right, now we're seeing. Check my mic pattern. I don't even know what that means. So that would be one of those things that, in Boomer Help, I would be like, oh. <laughs> All right, some people are saying that uh, they can hear me fine, so I guess we're just going to go with that. All right, cool, cool. So we have all kinds of fun stuff, almost at max volume. Oh, goodness. Okay, well, hopefully I'm not like, like nails on a chalkboard clipping things out. Robert Graham says there should be a switch on the mic. All right, I, I would have to like, stand up it's not a yeah it's it's a shotgun mic so and it's literally it's pointed right at me so i mean i could do it yeah i mean there's no other way to really mess around with it so all right well we'll just we'll just go with that you sound like daisy with tech <laughs> oh is she like that too all right, so um, I suppose we'll get right into it. I don't think that I have any announcements ahead of time. Um, uh, for those of you who didn't see the most recent video, I guess uh, I had mentioned it on the last stream that I was going to be doing it. Oh, that's right. I did mention on the last stream how we were going to add channel memberships because um, some folks had requested it. And um, it's just another way to, I literally, you guys, I cannot bring the mic closer to me. I see someone else saying um, it's literally this far away from my nose, and it's actually even supposed to be farther than that. <laughs> um, but yes, there had been some people that were requesting channel memberships because they don't like Patreon's policies, or they were sketched out by Subscribestar. Or, you know, they just wanted to be streamlined in all of uh, one place. So we do have YouTube memberships now. It, did, it does not mean that it is, this is a pay-per-view channel now, because I saw some people saying in the comments, like, oh, no, like, now it's a pay-per-view channel. Bye. No. It's just an extra thing that people can do if they want. Um, this is... I don't know if you guys can hear that, actually. I have a Fox window, uh, Fox News window that keeps, I don't know, refreshing itself and the sound keeps going off. So we're just going to mute the whole computer. Um, right, so it's just an extra thing and the people in the membership tiers get the same things that the folks over on Patreon do. And... Um, yeah, it uh, will allow you into the Discord. The only difference between the YouTube membership tiers and the Patreon and Subscribestar tiers is that you'll have to get like the links, I think, for, for the bonus content in Discord because typically I upload it as an unlisted video and I don't think that I can do members only and then also send it to people in Patreon. So that's really the only difference. 
And uh, Bruce the Boss says that pay-per-view is so 1990s. <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, we have a whole bunch of fun things to talk about tonight. Um, we have, the, it's not necessarily new revelations that uh, Joe and Hunter Biden shared a bank account. It was something that was mentioned before, but now it's only just now really starting to get attention. So we have some stuff about that. We have some crazy stuff going on in California where Gavin Newsom is going completely nutty with the fact that he didn't get recalled and is implementing all kinds of new policies. We talked previously about how he uh, basically was, he, he basically put a ban on single family zoning and uh, he was talking about some vaccine mandates and things like that. And now he's implementing um, a gender neutral toy requirement and also critical race theory in schools, which is pretty random. And then we also have, of course, the big sick out with the airline companies. That topic will be really interesting when we get to it. Because uh, it turns out that, <laughs> I mean, that one is actually pretty hard to find some information on because there's there's a lot of outlets that are like, oh, it's the weather and anything else is a vast conspiracy theory, even though we have all of these documents and text messages and, and things like that from actual people working for the airlines saying that it's about the vaccine mandate. So that's another one of those uh, funky topics that is getting reported a couple of different ways, we'll see. So let's see if the new thing works. Let's see. All right, let's see. I think that I think that worked. And we should also still be able to have the little, like, doodads that come down. All right. Um, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we can still get the full thing. So this, uh, we have a couple of different posts here about this. We'll start, we'll kind of go in, like, a little progression here. So first we have from the New York Post. Um... And this actually was written way back in July. And that that's how long things have kind of taken to come to light and be taken a little bit more seriously. Um, because remember, the Hunter Biden laptop story was originally broken by the New York Post and the mainstream media and Twitter and Facebook rushed it to the point where the New York Post was even getting banned from social media for spreading misinformation. Fast forward to a few months later, uh, after the election, then we got, oh, so legacy media is admitting that turns out the story was true, the laptop has been corroborated, this was a real thing, and they just didn't want that information getting out before the election because they were afraid that it would change the results of the election. And they have, of course, done actual surveys and polls since then with tons of people saying, well, yes, if I had known about this before voting, then I would not have voted for Biden. <laughs> so it really would have affected the results of the election. And this ties back into that timepiece and all of that with the uh, the secret cabal and how they were controlling the streams of information. So first we have this from the New York Post back on July 4th. And we're going to kind of follow the timeline here a little bit because that'll be fun. So this is from the New York Post, and it says that uh, <laughs> while Joe Biden careens around the country eating ice cream and behaving like a kind but slightly dotty grandpa, which is a nice way of saying it, it's worth remembering the cynical way he used his son Hunter to generate cash for the family. And then it talks about how Hunter had wanted to be an artist and blah, 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 blah. 
but we have this text message that was found on the laptop and it was written in 2019 and it says i hope you all can do what i did and pay for everything for this entire family for 30 years and this was in again a text message from 2019 to his daughter naomi that was and it was found on the laptop he went on to say it's really hard but don't worry unlike pop i won't make you give me half your salary but there was not any direct evidence of this wealth transfer back and forth between Hunter and Joe on Hunter's laptop. So they did not have proof that Hunter was literally taking like half of his salary and, and fielding it to Joe Biden. We also saw in uh, the original fountain of emails talks about you know, kickbacks for the big guy and all of that. So there was definitely some sus suspicions, but we didn't have a ton of proof. But we did learn also through the laptop is that while Joe was vice president, Hunter routinely paid at least some of his household expenses, including AT&T bills of around $190 a month. And there was an email back on June 5th in 2010 with the subject jrb bills to hunter from this guy eric sherwin um Schwerin, sorry and we'll be touching base on him in a minute he was a business partner of hunter biden's and they had emails back and forth talking about other bills that needed to be paid such as a 2600 dollars contract bill um for a stone retaining wall at Joe Biden's estate. There was also an almost $1,500 bill to a painter to also paint at Joe Biden's estate. $1,200 to a builder also for Joe Biden's estate. Um, and a Secret Service bill for $2,200 a month, um, almost $500 for shutters, things like that. And there are some quotes about some emails that were found on the laptop, but we haven't seen any of the actual emails yet at this point. This is just stuff that the New York Post reported on, said that they had seen, and was corroborated, corroborated by Tony Bobulinski. You might remember him from the original scandal as well. Uh, and him confirming that Joe Biden was the quote-unquote big guy that was mentioned in a 2017 email about a 10% equity deal from Hunter. And uh, that's pretty much all that we had on July 4th. Then we get this, and admittedly it is from Breitbart, but this is from July 12th. So a few days later. So this is something from the president of Government Accountability Institute. And he said that his organization had confirmed that President Joe Biden was a direct beneficiary of Hunter Biden's financial deals with foreign interests. And he said that they have a copy at the GIA of Hunter Biden's laptop and all of the files. And he said this on the Sean Hannity show. We're not going to watch or listen to that. They said that it confirmed that Joe Biden was a direct beneficiary of these Hunter deals. On the show, he said, well, how can we demonstrate whether the emails are real? We already have the Secret Service travel records, and those were already released. We have official records that the Secret Service traveled with Hunter to this location, that location, etc. And then they said, well, do the emails on Hunter's laptop correspond with the travel records, etc., etc." And this is how that they were trying to corroborate some of those emails. So we had Hunter Biden, the Hunter Biden text. We had some emails that the New York Post was talking about. And then the Government Accountability uh, Institute confirmed, but we still hadn't seen any of the actual emails. Enter now the Daily Mail, and the Daily Mail has actually published these emails now. So now we have proof of these emails. And a little bit more details on what exactly all of this entails and what it could mean. So 
Here from the Daily Mail, Joe Biden could become embroiled in the FBI's probe into Hunter's financer, finances, experts say. Emails reveal they shared bank accounts, paid each other's bills, and the president may have even funded his son's 2018 drug and prostitution binge. Fun stuff. So, according to the Daily Mail, emails recovered from Hunter Biden's uh, abandoned laptop between Hunter and Eric Schroerin, his business partner at consultant agency Rosemont Seneca, show that Schroerin was working on Joe's taxes for some reason rather than an actual government entity and was also discussing the father and son paying each other's household bills and even fielding requests for a book deal for the then vice president as well as managing the donation of Joe's Senate papers to the University of Delaware. And no one knows or can say why this guy was the guy, was the guy in Joe Biden's financial affairs rather than government officials in the office of the vice president, because typically that is the way that it's supposed to go, that he had this rando dude doing it who also had a business relationship with his son and was involved in these business dealings and these kickbacks and all of these fun, corrupt things. So then the Daily Mail also talked to a formal former federal prosecutor and expert on money laundering and criminal tax law. They wouldn't name him, as is common now in any news article. And, you know, jur both journalism and journalism. But this guy says that whatever transaction you're looking at, if there's a connection to a family member or a friend, the answer is absolutely yes, that that person would be investigated. The issue is that we are talking about Joe Biden and everyone in the media and in D.C. right now loves Joe Biden. So I think that there is not really a shot in hell, quite frankly, that Joe Biden is actually going to be investigated in any of this. But it would be nice to dream, right? I mean, I suppose who knows what could happen, um later on because at this point hunter biden is being investigated for corruption he's being investigated because he lied on those uh form what is it 4473s i think that's the number the uh, gun permit application he also is being investigated for money laundering and now we have these emails of him putting money into Joe Biden's bank account and swirling it all together. Which kind of looks like money laundering. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and Joe Biden, we're finding little connections to, like, all of these things, right? I mean, with three separate investigations going... You would think someone would look at this guy, but of course, you know, the uh, executive branch is in Joe Biden's pocket right now, and they've certainly been outside of Trump's pocket while he was even in office. All of those things came out. It, we, we know all about that. But um, unfortunately, there's a fat chance that anything is going to happen with this, but I mean, it is good information to have and who knows what could happen if uh biden isn't in the white house anymore in 2024 i mean uh that would not be outside the statute of limitations just gonna scroll by these pictures that youtube won't want us to <laughs> won't want us to put on screen so the FBI and IRS probe is reportedly also looking into his foreign business relationships and the potential for money laundering charges, as I said. And John Kassara, a former U.S. intelligence officer and Treasury special agent who is an expert in money laundering investigations, said that if Joe wasn't president, he would probably be in the prosecutor's crosshairs already. But again, 
He's the president, so that's not going to happen. In yet more evidence of the deep commercial relationship between Hunter's firm and the VP's office during Joe's tenure, Rosemont Seneca received special favors from the White House while Joe was in office, including dozens of tickets to exclusive White House events and private tours for Rosemont Seneca clients or associates. And when an aide to Senator Robert Menendez, and that's the other reason why I don't think that anything will happen to Joe Biden over this, when an aide to Bob Menendez requested VP Biden host the U.S. Spain's Council 2010 annual meeting at his official Naval Observatory residence in Washington, D.C., they contacted Schwerin rather than Joe's White House office. So again, they're looking for favors, they're looking for financial deals, so they talk to this guy that's involved with Hunter Biden and their weird little business dealings, duo bank account, rather than anyone actually at the White House. It's a little fishy. Hunter and Schwerin then privately discussed the potential to ingratiate themselves with CEOs of the major banks if they helped arrange the request. Not suspicious at all. So we have some of the actual emails here. Um, so this is from Eric Schwerin to, we're assuming, Hunter Biden. Your dad's Delaware tax refund check came today. I'm depositing it in his bank account and writing a check in that amount back to you since he owes it to you. Don't think I need to run it by him, but if you want to, go ahead. If not, I will deposit tomorrow. So there we have it that, uh, well, Hunter Biden, uh, Joe owes Hunter some money, and so they're putting it out of that joint bank account. We have this other one here. This was from April 7th about the U.S. Spain Council. Daniel, uh, Daniel O'Brien calls Senator Menendez is U.S. chair of the above group. Spanish members include CEOs of the major banks, and uh, it lists some people. Having their annual meeting in D.C. in July. Spanish foreign minister attends. Danny wants to explore with you possibility of getting VP to host event at... Uh, NAVOBs for group, maybe even an appearance at a reception at a hotel. I'll get more info and we can discuss with Danny next week. I think Solomon mentioned your interest in Spain and that is why Danny is calling us. Probably don't want to mention to Transatlantic in case we can't deliver. And this is, again, from Eric Schwerin rather than anyone at the U.S. government and it's going to Hunter Biden. So for some reason, they're arranging meetings with uh, foreign leaders and CEOs of major banks rather than government entities. It's a little weird. Um, also, we have, uh, so this is for the University of Delaware for Joe's Senate papers, also from Eric Schwerin. If you want to be in the loop, I sent to Mel and she was... Well, he or she was also mentioned in previous emails, was going to talk to your dad about this and decide who should work on it between him and Jamie. And then we have a follow-up message again about these, this donation to the University of Delaware, again, to this guy, Eric Schwerin. <laughs> Back and forth. So also in some of these emails, Hunter complained that half of his salary went to paying his father's bills. There was also that text message that we saw while he was VP, casting doubt on Joe's previous claims that he's never benefited from his son's business dealings. Bills p Hunter paid for Joe included a $190 a month AT&T phone bill and thousands in repairs on the president's lakeside home in Wilmington. In a 2018 e email to one of his own assistants, Hunter complained that he had been shut out of his own bank account and that his father had been using it. And he, one of the things he said was, My dad has been using most lines on this account, which I've, through the gracious offerings of Eric, have paid for the last 11 years. And there were repeated references on the laptop to Joe and Hunter paying each other's bills. So here is one of those emails, 
And if you can see, the subject line is JRB Bills. And it's again from Eric Schroen. FYI, there are a few outstanding bills that need to be paid, and I'm not sure which ones are a priority and which should get paid out of quote unquote my account and which should be put on hold or paid out of the Wilmington Trust Social Security check account. There is about $2,000 extra in my account, and we don't really know why my keeps getting put in quotations. Uh, beyond what is used for monthly expenses, I could probably pay number two, three, and then four now, and then possibly four A, and then let me know if they, there are a few we can pay from the Wilmington Trust account. And then here are a list of some of these bills right in this email. So uh, FYI, your annual workman's comp premium came due for your household employee, and that was 632. Fran Person is owed $436 for things he paid for on your trip to Arizona and Madrid. Uh, there's a bill for your new line of credit from the Senate Credit Union, which is $383 a month. And I assume that you want to have this deducted from your salary automatically. If so, it will obviously be $383 less a month in your household bill account. There's a number of Mike Christopher bills outstanding, and it lists uh, $1,200 for repairs to the AC. And uh, again, this is the painting and the stone wall that was mentioned in the New York Post article, but we didn't have the emails at the time. Here's the email about that. Also $969 to Kiowa Island for your golf, etc., that you played in August. Finally, I wanted to discuss the rental income you are going to receive for leasing out Mom Mom's cottage. Since this counts as income, we should hold a little back to be able to pay the taxes at the end of the year. If you want to have it deposited into my account, I can hold back a portion and deposit the remainder into the Wilmington Trust account. Again, this is from Eric Schwerwin, and it is to Hunter Biden about Joe Biden's bills coming out of their joint bank account. Um, Mike Christopher is hassling me, so I'm paying a couple of these smaller things since I haven't heard from your dad. I know he's busy, so it's okay, but if you think he has a free moment or two to review the email I sent you, let me know. And, uh, this is from someone else to Hunter about Joe Biden. Do I need to do anything with this right now? And, uh, this is more emails here a forwarded email with more emails back and forth about book dealings and bills and things like that so those are the actual emails and saying like there's one of like well who should who should pay it do you and Bo want to split it should i ask the sister sarah or your dad it needs to get paid and that's for an 800 dollar bill from bill morgan for more work <laughs> For the Biden family, household help, taxes, etc. Um, and some of these emails even go all the way to November of 2015. Here's that email. And they're all from Eric Schroen to Hunter Biden about Joe Biden's finances and their bank account. It's pretty awkward, actually. <laughs> Here's another one about an Easter egg roll and White House events. So it just keeps going and going and going. Hunter's claim that he and his father shared a bank account also raises serious questions whether funds from the alleged joint account were used for Hunter's May of 2018 week-long week bender with a prostitute in a Hollywood hotel. On May 24th, 2018, a recently retired senior Secret Service officer, Robert Savage, texted Hunter warning he would have to assume you are in danger and commandeer keys to the room if he didn't come out of his $470 per night suite at the Jeremy Hotel in LA where he had been holed up with a Russian hooker to whom he wired $25,000. For a hooker, that better be a damn good hooker. <laughs> the agent added, come on, H, this is linked to Celtic's account. And Celtic was the Secret Service codename 
for Joe Biden. DC is calling me every 10 minutes. Let me up or come down. I can't help if you don't let me. They say that it's unclear whether the agent's reference to Celtic's account was about charges for prostitutes on the Joe Biden bank account or his employment by Joe Biden to monitor his son. But either way, it sounds like there were complaints that Joe Biden paid $25,000 for Hunter Biden's hooker, and that's why the folks over at Washington were freaking out, because $25,000 was going to a hooker. <laughs> so fun and exciting stuff. Robert Graham says, twenty-five grand, I could... <laughs> I could get the job done for $500. <laughs> so I know that we had a su few super chats come in. Um, let's see. Um, Fred Hill, welcome to the membership. And uh, Gamma, Gamma Goblin Miller, you as well. So let's see, how can I... Maybe it was just those memberships and not the... Super chats, I think. Okay. Someone, so Robert Graham says that Taco Bell is up by 25%. Are you talking about prices or stocks? <laughs> because uh, I just bought Taco Bell the other day, but I didn't notice. So there we have it. That is, uh, <laughs> Dylan says a $25,000 girl better show up with $24,000 of cash. I will um, put the link in the chat. Let's see. I don't know how to do that. I think I can do that over here in case anyone wants to see those emails for themselves. Um, I put it in an archive link because the Daily Mail, when you link to them, um, after a while, I don't know, they refresh their pages and you have to actually go back and find the article. Like the link doesn't work after a certain period of time. So instead, I put it on archive so that you guys would be able to check it out whenever. Uh, Robert Graham says it's retail prices. Wow, oh, okay. That is pretty crazy. The dollar menu is now a buck 25 to a buck 45. Well, didn't McDonald's do that ages ago? Um, but uh, actually, since you guys are bringing up the changes in prices i did not get a chance to read this article but i saw a <laughs> a screenshot of an article that popped up in bloomberg that said um that we need more inflation because it's better for prices and let me see if i can find that article. Since you guys are bringing it up. Um, let's see. Inflation insights. The Fed should try to make it permanent. Let's see. Here we go. Here is, here we go. I'm going to archive this real quick. So that I don't get stuck with the paywall. <laughs> I didn't get to read this article, but um, I think it'll be fun. So since you guys are talking about price increases in the chat, then we'll jump to this real quick. And then uh, we'll get into some of the other topics. So like I said, haven't read this yet. I only saw the screenshot of it on uh, Facebook earlier today. So this is... Came, uh, this popped up in Bloomberg a few days ago. America needs higher, longer-lasting inflation. The benefits of moderately rising prices and wages outweigh the costs. Ugh. Already that makes my head hurt. Um, because if we have inflation, then the dollar is worth less. So the fact that prices are going up... Well, they say wages are going up, but prices are going up as well. So it usually cancels each other out. And it means that you have a lot less buying power. So <laughs> uh, clearly this person 
does not understand basic economics. And I see uh, Omega, Ra uh, Omega says, Taco Bell, no more $5 box, now $6. Oh, and you know what? The little, okay. All right, it is working. Um, and I do apologize as well. I actually ended up having to buy this, <laughs> this um, overlay set for OBS because I, I, I tried and I, I couldn't get things to work on my own. And I, after I bought it, I realized they didn't have an option for an alert that was just Super Chats. So um, I'm actually message the person who created it and see if they can do that for me. And that's why it just says tips, even though it's still a super chat. All right, so here we have this article. America needs higher, longer lasting inflation printed in Bloomberg. So let's see what they have to say and, and how they justify this. The administration of President Joe Biden has repeatedly assured Americans that the sharp uptick in inflation they are experiencing is temporary, in the language of economists, transitory. So that is already, I mean, Joe Biden has said that, but the Fed at this point, the Federal Reserve has admitted that it is not transitory and it is here to stay. And that's one of the big hullabaloos over the debt ceiling. I mean, there's a hullabaloo over the debt ceiling every year, every time it comes up. Uh, Biden did sign something to raise the debt ceiling again, by the way, which just kicks the can down the road some more. But already, it's pretty interesting that Americans that don't even necessarily know much about economics can see that something's messed up when Joe Biden is now at record low approval ratings and record high disapproval ratings because of a combination of Afghanistan, his handling of COVID with the mandates. That's when things really started to drop for him actually was the, when he announced the mandates combination of that. And also what's going on with the economy and inflation. The Fed has admitted that this is not transitory. It is here to stay. And there's, there's no easy way out of this. As I mentioned last week, they can raise interest rates and that will help some degree, but of course it will correspond with a little bit of temporary downtick in the economy and in the stock market, which will make people panic. So no matter what the Fed does at this point, they are going to be blamed for these issues, and rightfully so. But that temporary dip in the economy and in the stock market is way better than what is coming down the road. But anyways, surveys suggest that the public is less than convinced, but consumer expectations of inflation are notoriously fickle. This person says, this guy, uh, Carl Smith. All of this has economists and central bankers dutifully poring over data for signs of when or whether inflation, currently just under 4%. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, we'll drift back towards the Federal Reserve's target of 2%. The fact that it's over the Federal Reserve's target is a problem in and of itself, but okay. Instead, they should be considering a more fundamental question, whether the Fed should strive to make 4% inflation permanent. Oh my God. These people don't know anything. Uh, to be clear, there is no doubt that the recent rise in price growth has been an unpleasant shock. That's partly because it is so uneven. And we know that things like food products especially have hit double digit numbers. Um, Corn hit triple digit numbers. I believe so did lumber. Uh, copper is in double digits. We've looked at some different graphs and infographics that have had the inflation numbers of different goods and services, and it definitely isn't even at all. I mean, we're talking everything from like, you know, 4% to 150%. So I'll, I'll give the writer that. Prices on commodities such as gasoline and lumber, along with a few select goods such as used cars, have risen by double-digit rates. And uh, part of this also is because of supply issues. 
we all know about the supply issues with um, those ships that are still hanging out in the ports and not being unloaded, but it's to the point now that, and, and thank you for the folks on the Discord for bringing this to my attention, but it's even in causing issues in that you guys are familiar with Augustin Farms. They're one of the companies that make dehydrated emergency food. Um, they have announced, I believe, that they're not accepting uh, new orders or doing any new production for the next 90 days because they can't actually get the supplies to make anything. They can't get the supplies to put their emergency food kits together, which is pretty scary when even your emergency food kits for emergencies are put on hold because of the supply chain issues and stock shortages. Like, that's pretty scary. Um, I don't think that Emergency Essentials is having that issue right now. I don't think Mountain House is having that issue. My Patriot Supply, um, the stuff that I can get the deals and, and coupons for you guys that are linked down in the description, they don't have... Um, they they don't have any of those issues right now. They haven't alerted any of us about any of those issues, but Augustin Farms is one of the big companies and they got nothing. Um Warhorse says that they're fake supply issues. The dock workers union is fishing for more money. Well, one of the things that Joe Biden did is he said, well, now that those now those ports are going to be open 24 seven for a limited period of time to try and get at the backlog. But um, part of the issue is, in fact, the unions. Um, part of the issue is that they don't have enough workers to unload the, this stuff they don't have enough truckers to deliver it and it's kind of a problem that was brewing for a while and has been compounded over time and then the you know covid 1984 hit and all of this really just exploded but i did hear recently that those um union dock workers get a salary that is comparable to members of congress which is interesting. And I'll just leave it at that. Anyways. So they say that a sharp increase in the price of even a small set of product products creates far more pain than a rise of the overall inflation rate, which is one of their arguments, apparently, as to why we should have permanent inflation, because then it's averaged across thousands of products that narrow inflation is also the type of inflation that's most likely to reverse itself since it reflects supply chain disruptions that will eventually be relieved. It's going to take a long ass fucking time, let me tell you, to relieve these issues. <laughs> Analysts are concerned the rise in inflation may be persistent because they see hints of a broader, gentler rise in prices across a range of goods and uh, the rages of workers who produce those products. Okay. So the writer says that this increase in both wages and prices can lead to the dreaded wage price spiral, but because it's shared by both households and businesses, the pain is muted. I, I don't know about all that. Because um, we've seen reports that people on the lower tiers of uh, the income scale, scale are now paying 30 to 40 percent of their monthly budget on things like groceries. So I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how muted that really is. <laughs> And uh, the writer says that indeed a higher rate of inflation and correspondingly higher wage growth could be a net positive for the economy. Okay, I, I need to see this guy's reasons. So he says there are two main reasons. The first is debt dynamics, that higher rates of inflation make debt more expensive but easier to manage. Okay. A permanent increase in inflation from 2% to 4% would cause interest rates to rise by roughly 2% as well as lenders sought to protect themselves from rising prices. Okay. But the real interest rate after accounting for inflation remains the same. Okay. 
and they use the mortgage market as an example. Okay. Yet wage growth was also slow over the last decade, so those same families haven't seen their mortgage payments decline as a fraction of their income at the same rates as previous generations, so they have less room to manage unforeseen expenses. I don't understand this guy's reasonings as to why we need permanent inflation. So increases, permanent increases in inflation and wages would reverse this whole process because it would decrease mortgage sizes and maximum bids, which would slow the rise in home prices. This guy clearly has not looked at the real estate market in the last like five years. There is a burned down house in Melrose, I believe right now in Boston, outside of Boston, burned down house that it, it says right on the listing that it needs to be torn down because it's all burnt to a crisp and it was listed for $400,000 and it's under contract. <laughs> this guy has no idea what he's talking about. He says the second reason to support higher inflation and the resulting higher nominal interest rates has less to do with homeowners than the Federal Reserve. Oh God. So they say that the higher interest rates would give the Fed more room to cut interest rates in case of a downturn. Okay, so he says that the Fed needs to, that we need to have higher inflation, so it gives them more room to lower interest rates, but lowering interest rates will only increase inflation. They need to raise interest rates to help bring inflation down and, oh my God. I don't even, I don't even know if I can finish. Oh, and that, that actually is pretty much the end of the article. And then he says, well, the next, hopefully the next recession will not be the result of a global pandemic. It won't, it will be because of this guy's dumb ideas. Wow, this is just dumb. I'm gonna put this in the chat. I feel like I shouldn't have even wasted my time with that article. That guy clearly doesn't know anything. <laughs> anything at all. I did see some super chats come in. I like when I can have my sound on and get the alerts, but that stupid Fox News thing is uh, preventing that. So let's see. Um... So, uh, Glockstar for Kids says $25,000 for a hooker. Make it $20. Same as downtown. <laughs> Irish Lover says you're the best around. No one ever going to bring you down. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to sing that, but I'm not singing that. Uh, Gardner says this is in honor of the Bloomberg writer who digs the idea of making it harder to get what we want. I'm spending now before this money devalues even more. That is a legitimate investment and financial strategy, actually. I tell people about that, and um, you can go on like those financial channels on YouTube of all those people that give um, different like investment and financial advice of like how to pay off debt and, and make your money go farther and um, how to have really good financial health and stuff like that. And they'll all say that in periods like now, when prices are going crazy and inflation is skyrocketing, you are better off spending today rather than spending tomorrow because the, the how fast the dollar is devaluing your money will never again be worth what it is today. Each day it loses purchasing power, so you are better off spending that money today and buying things today than waiting a, a month, a year, five years, whatever, because we are careening off the cliff. Even if we weren't careening off the cliff, normal in inflation, this would still hold true, true, but we are careening off the cliff so quickly right now, there is no turning back ever, 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 ever. What you can buy today with a dollar, you will never again be able to buy with a dollar, the way that things are going. Uh, Jesse says, sorry, I'm late, everyone. This month has been a very long year. God, how I wish that was a typo. Well, and Jesse 
has been having to drive through the snow and he sent me a picture of the snow that he was driving through the other day and my my heart plunged into my guts and I got this horrible sense of dread and then I remembered, oh yeah, I live in the South now, so I don't need to worry about that. So thank you for that reminder, Jesse. Uh, Ricky Hendricks says, I heard today that California emission laws will not allow truckers into the state, exacerbating the problem. I haven't heard of that, but uh, that would not surprise me, quite frankly. And that would definitely exacerbate the problem. There's been like this um, sort of meme going around. It's a screenshot from Twitter. And it's, it's basically like, yeah, I'm not saying that the government is involved in this vast conspiracy to, like, wreck the economy and, and you know, make supply shortages and, and do all of these crazy things. But, like, if they were, what would they be doing differently? It's a good question to ask yourself. <laughs> Uh, Christoph says, part of the problem is owner-operator trucks can't go into California unless they were, are newer and meet special restrictions. All right, so we have two people saying that, so um, that must be a legitimate thing. And uh, Glock Surfer Kid says, the higher the inflation rate, the more stuff goes down in price as the money supply is exhausted by the men farting valve. <laughs> Sure, we'll we'll say that. <laughs> we'll we'll go with that. Why not? <laughs> All right. So, um what do we have left? Oh yeah, so we we mentioned California. You guys mentioned California. So, let's let's jump into this stuff here. Over in California with good old Gavin Newsom. So this one is from the LA Times, though I've seen it many other places at this point as well. California will now require large retailers to provide gender-neutral toy sections because this is uh, an excellent use of government power and taxpayer funds because why not? So they say that California became the first state in the nation because California always has to pave the way for stupid shit. Remember, friends, this is the uncensored. <laughs> uh, California became the first state in the nation Saturday to adopt a new law requiring large retail stores to provide gender-neutral toy sections under a bill signed by Governor Gavin Newsom. So for some reason, the new law doesn't take effect until 2024. So this is really about like feel good virtue signaling. But uh, starting in 2024, retail stores with 500 or more employees must sell some toys and child care products outside of areas specifically labeled by gender. So this is interesting because child care products Specifically, like, I go into Target and I'm looking for baby stuff. And yeah, there's, like, there's boy outfits and then there's girl outfits and then there's always things that are in, like, grays and yellows and greens that eh, could go for anything. I mean, and that's with clothing, but things like, you know, if I'm looking at, at a boppy, those are, like, nursing pillows or ribs or any of the other things that you could possibly buy when you are preparing for a baby like that stuff isn't put together by gender they don't have bottles by gender they don't have the swings and tubs and things like that by gender so this all already here like child care goods and child care products having to be outside of areas labeled by gender. I don't know where these people are shopping, but I've been in several baby stores recently. Those things aren't arranged by gender. Just putting it out there. Retailers can continue to offer other toys and childcare goods in traditional boys and girls sections if they choose to. Again, you know, you do, you'd have like your your superhero dinosaur Lego aisle of toys, and then you have like your Barbie baby doll oh, like aisle of toys. 
But anything else for children and and babies especially, again, I haven't seen those in gendered aisles. So I don't know what California is, well, I do know what California is smoking, but I don't know why they think that this is a thing. <laughs> Newsom offered no comment on the bill signing, one of several announced in the final batch of legislative actions weighed for the year. Assembly Bill 1084 continues a gradual shift in the retail industry away from strictly marketing children's products under traditional gender stereotypes, because this is so important, said Assemblyman Evan Lowe, who introduced the legislation. Target dropped boys and girls toy sections in 2015, and other retailers have since moved away from gender-specific labels. So if big retailers are already doing this, why do we need a law? Why do we need Newsom to waste taxpayer dollars on that? Who is going to enforce this? So is, is California going to start this new government position of, like, auditing Target or auditing Walmart? Are they going to be sending government agents into these big box stores to go inspect their toy aisles and their like crib and baby tub aisles like is this going to be a thing this is really what we're th this is really what they're going to spend money on gavin newsom this is uh the important issues not the literal shit on your streets not the literal homelessness just everywhere in california not the needles all over the ground. No, we are going to make sure that there are aisles of toys and boppies and cribs and baby tubs that are not arranged in pink or blue. Because that's what matters. Part of it is to make sure if you're a young girl that you can find a police car, fire truck, a periodic table, or a dinosaur, he said, because apparently parents don't understand that if you want a fire truck, you go into the fire truck aisle and you take your kid to the fire truck aisle. Apparently, that is outside the scope of mental abilities of the parents of California, according to this assemblyman. He said, similarly, if you're a boy and you're more artistic and want to play with glitter, why not? Okay, glitter isn't even in the toy aisle. It's in the fucking craft department, which is not gendered. This guy has clearly never bought a speck of glitter in his life. If he thinks that, bl that glitter is kept with the Barbies, that's not how it works. It's in the craft aisle with the glue and the markers and the other crafty stuff. And that section isn't gendered. In fact, I think in a lot of places, it's in with office supplies. Oh my God. I can't. I can't. This is so stupid. And, and why, why do the people of California support this bullshit? I will never understand. Uh, because according to this guy, there's a stigma and feeling ashamed if you have to walk to a different aisle for glitter, he should feel ashamed for not knowing where the damn glitter actually is because he's so dumb and doesn't know that glitter is in the craft department that he had to write a law that somehow got all the way up to the governor's desk. People voted on this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of, your, of California, this is what you are paying your Congress people to do to vote about where the glitter goes. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Lowe said the daughter of one of his staff members inspired the bill when the girl questioned why she had to go to the boys' section to find certain toys. I mean, it is a stereotype, but traditionally, boys like the louder toys and fire trucks and police trucks and dinosaurs. I mean, I loved dinosaurs as a kid. I was all about the dinosaurs and Legos, but it, I don't, I mean, does it really matter that bad? 
<sighs> Democratic lawmakers received criticism for so-called nanny state governing as the proposal moved through the legislature this year, which, with opponents arguing that government should not tell a private company how to organize or display its merchandise. And that is valid because you know what? Stereotypes exist for a reason. And if traditionally little girls have liked to play with dolls, that doesn't mean that little boys can't play with dolls. It's just like, oh, well, let's put the things that girls typically like to play with together in one place so they're easier to find. It's like half stores marketing in certain ways because there are psychologists, I guess, and marketing geniuses who arrange things in stores in certain ways to make people buy them. But the other part of that is convenience and just following um, the history of human behavior. Sorry, California, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but I mean, certainly the critics are right that the government of California has no business telling private businesses how to run their businesses. And I mean, I, I would imagine this would have some pretty wide reaching effects because like, if it's businesses that have 500 or more employees, okay, so we're, we're talking probably big box stores, right? There's going to be corporations. They're going to have to like, do some construction or something. They're going to have to pay people to move these toys. And then it's like, all right, so now are they going to like reflect that across all of their stores now? I mean, and that in and of itself isn't a big deal if they were to decide to do that on their own. So what? It's the fact that Gavin Newsom is telling private companies where they need to put their Legos and their glitter. Even though, again... The glitter is in its own aisle, away from anything gendered. And uh, again, the baby tubs and the baby merchandise and childcare products, typically, from my experience so far, while limited, are also not in weird gendered aisles. But okay. <laughs> um, and they hired a... Uh... They, they talked to a professor of psychology at UC Santa Cruz who said that companies began using gender labels and pink and blue indicators to market products specifically to girls or boys during the 40s and 50s. And uh, it's bad for three-year-olds, according to this person. And then it actually goes into the psychology and uh, developmental things that come with using toys. Okay. And here we go. Retailers that fail to comply with the new law will be subject to minimal civil penalties of $200 for a first violation and $500 for additional violations. So again, that means that um, California is going to pay people to look at these violations and they are either going to rely on public reporting it because... That's what the public does now since COVID-1984 is snitch on people to the cops or, you know, whatever government agency. They're either going to rely on that or there will be a new job at the government and the job description will be gender neutral toy enforcement agency, <laughs> glitter enforcement agency, <laughs> and people will get paid to go and audit these stores and write out citations. This is so stupid. So stupid. California, ladies and gentlemen. Also in California, California is to make a critical race theory a high school graduation requirement. On Friday, Gavin Newsom signed a bill that makes the state the first in the country to require ethnic studies courses for all public high school students mandatory in order to graduate. So this takes place even further down the line. This isn't going to be until the 2029 school year, which is a weird flex. 
Starting in 2029, California high school students will be required to take a course on ethnic studies alongside the traditionally required English, math, and science classes in order to graduate high school. Uh, California is the first state to do this, and it is for all public high school students, and it's mandatory to graduate. The author of the critical race theory legislation that has been in the workings for years, Jose Medina, called the bill a huge step for California. Now, I will say, um, I would have to read the actual bill. There is in the if we're using the exact definition and this is something we've talked about before if we're using the exact definition of ethnic studies versus critical race theory they're two different things um ethnic studies could be something like so in grad school and in college i was required to take multiculturalism classes and that was largely because i was in the psychology field and you have to know about other cultures when you work in that field because like you don't want to have uh someone from haiti come in into your office and demonstrate something that's totally culturally appropriate in haiti but you think is weird and so you diagnose them with a mental illness basically I mean, things like that. Uh, even in high school, we had, um, I went to Catholic school and we had a world religions class that was required learning because we had to take a religion class every year. Senior year, it was world religions where you also learned about Judaism and um, Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam. Okay, cool. I mean, it was interesting and it was kind of cool stuff to learn and you learned about the history of those religions and the similarities between them so that you could like see connections and differences things like that the final project was really sweet you had to make a board game involving religion and i distinctly remember and you had to do a commercial i remember something i remember creating christ checks or whatever from the dane cook skit anyways Something like that. I mean, it's kind of weird to mandate it, but if it's a class, fine. They could be talking about multicultural things where you learn about other heritages and their languages and holidays and blah, blah, blah. Fine. Critical race theory is something entirely different. Critical race theory, by definition, is legal studies program that involves race, basically. But then we have critical race theory and then we have it in practice. In practice is the stuff of like when they incorporate, uh, you know, capitalism bad, all white people are racist into like word problems in math. So it's not clear from this article which of those things that we're talking about. I'm leaning probably towards actual critical race theory in practice. Um, which comes out looking pretty racist, depending on who you ask. Just based on the fact that there are a lot of school boards coming out now. And even um, one of the overarching teachers unions for the entire country talked about how we have to incorporate critical race theory and anti-capitalism into the classroom. So I'm willing to bet it's more about that than just like, well, let's learn about other cultures. Because if it was just learning about other cultures, I feel like they wouldn't be putting it in a bill perfectly timed right now when CRT is such a big thing. So according to ABC7, the new law requires all public schools in the state to offer at least one ethnic studies course starting in the 2025 school year and require students graduating in 2029 to have completed a one semester course in the subject. The new legislation offers a few years so that schools can prepare and refine course loads and content. The model curriculum focuses on four historically marginalized groups that are central to college level ethnic studies, African Americans, Chicanos and other Latinos, Asian Americans and Pacific Island Islanders and Native Americans. It also reportedly includes lesson plans on groups that are not traditionally part of ethnic studies curriculum, including Jews, Armenian Americans, Arab Americans, and Sheik Americans. Okay. 
Uh, those groups were reportedly added, added after objections were raised to an earlier draft that le left them out. And it follows, okay, here we go. It follows in the footsteps of several of California's largest school districts, which have already implemented their version of this bill. So there we have it. That in and of itself, it doesn't expressly say, yes, it's CRT practice. But if they're modeling it after stuff that schools in California are already doing, then it is CRT in practice. Praxis, they call it. It's critical race praxis. Um, and the examples they gave are the LA Unified School District, Fresno, and San Francisco. So there we have it. It does look like it is, in fact, critical race praxis and not just ethnic studies. Which is really disappointing that they're going to make it a requirement. Um, I know that we had some super chats come in, so I am going to uh, jump and grab those. Mark Fallos, thank you very much for the generous donation. Um, Mike Fabush, welcome to membership of the channel. Um, Omega says, operations manager of a trucking company can confirm. Okay, Tommy Forma has, Tommy Fornia has despotic regulations for trucks older than five years and most experienced owner operators average trucks that are at least 10 plus years. Okay, so I mean, there is a lot of stuff going on that prevents um, <laughs> California ports at least from getting emptied and moving along, it sounds like. Glocks are for kids, says, I need to have some fun at the gun shop and rearrange all of the guns by color and gender. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, Jesse says, it's simple, LD. Every time somebody says, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, they take it as a challenge and raise the bar. That must be what it is. There must be some, like, karmic, cosmic force that's making this stuff happen. Um... Lena Siberia says, we may be rushing towards financial ruin, but hey, no more mean tweets from Big Bad Orange Man, right? Right. And uh, Omega says, call it crap. Critical race applied principle. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty accurate, right? <laughs> and for some reason, we are talking about pumpkin spice in the chat now. And I thought that I had a BRB screen on here, but apparently I don't. I want to BRB and close the door because husband's home, and I feel like you guys might be able to hear his movie. I'm not entirely sure, but I can hear it, and I'm not confident that the noise thingy I put on the mic is stopping it. So one moment, please. <laughs> All right. And now you, now you, you, it doubles as the baby bump. <laughs> Normally I'm pretty good at closing the door, but I uh, did not today. <laughs> All right. You know what? Pumpkin spice is awesome, you guys. So I don't know what you're talking about. All right. So let's get to, um, we'll get to this final thing here about the uh, everything going on with Southwest. So I'm going to start it off with, I feel like Fox News is probably going to be the most accurate here <sighs> because all the other outlets are putting things about anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theories and right-wing blah, blah, blah. So we're going to go with what Fox News actually says because I feel like we have a better chance of it being, I don't know, accurate, I suppose. So um, this we're going to have to go over kind of quickly here, but I wanted to cover it because it was put in the title of today's show. So Southwest Airlines faces the fifth day of delays and cancellations. And this was from a couple of days ago. I don't know if you guys have seen, I think it was uh, Jack Posobiec. 
I think it was over on Twitter. Um, there's a, a photo that's been going around of a Southwest Airlines plane with a Gadsden flag hanging on it, which is pretty sweet. According to Fox Business, Southwest Airlines continued to cancel and delay a handful of flights Tuesday, although it expects exponential improvements by the hour, it says. So for those of you that don't know, earlier in the week, the Southwest Airlines canceled literally thousands of flights. And they blamed it on the weather. Uh, some articles blame it specifically on weather in Florida, particularly. But if you looked at the actual weather picture and the weather forecasts in the country, uh, there was not a cloud in the sky <laughs> in most of these areas in the US. There wasn't any crazy detrimental storms or harsh, severe weather in most of these places so there's no reason why a lot of these flights theoretically should have been canceled if it was indeed due to weather so we had so we had southwest and we had the legacy media saying that it was because of weather while we had people from southwest and air traffic controllers and all of this saying it was because people were walking out over vaccine mandates. So it really became a he, sh he said, she said type thing of going back and forth. And I mean, we do have uh, like this article here, uh, anti-vaxxers think that the freedom flu caused America's flight chaos. Here's what it means. And, uh, you know, how it's a big conspiracy theory and blah, 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 blah. So articles like this is why we're going with the Fox News article. The Texas-based carrier said in a statement to Fox Business that it projects to have approximately 90 system-wide cancellations out of the airline's almost 3,300 flights scheduled Tuesday, marking the fifth day of operation woes for the carrier. According to Flight Tracker Flight Aware, Southwest already canceled 87 flights as of 11 a.m., and this was on the 12th? Yes. This was a few days ago. Um, meanwhile, approximately 370 flights had already been delayed, and that was as of 11 a.m., just on one day. It's a far cry from over the weekend when the carrier canceled more than 1,000 flights or 29% of its schedule. So it canceled almost a third of its schedule on Sunday alone. On Saturday, the airline canceled 808 flights and had 1,187 flights delayed. So on Saturday, a third of its flights were either canceled or delayed and then the same thing happened again on Sunday with just the cancellations alone. Disruptions began to ease Monday with cancellations amounting to 10% of Southwest schedule. At least 1,400 other flights or roughly 40% were delayed. I mean, these numbers are absolutely nuts. Absolutely nuts. Southwest said that it experienced weather challenges in its Florida airports at the beginning of the weekend, which were compounded by unexpected air traffic control issues in the same reason or in the same region, and that that is what triggered delays and prompted significant cancellations beginning Friday evening. In other words, they are blaming the whole shebang on Florida man and Florida weather. To recap the weekend cancellations, the bad weather and ATC issues in Florida, a large operation for us on Friday night, created significant flight disruptions throughout our network, and we spent the weekend working to recover from the high number of displaced crews and aircraft, is what the carrier told Fox News and was telling everybody else. He said uh, this, the... Uh, Carrier also said the issues were not a result of employee demonstrations, as some have reported. And it left tons and tons of people stranded. But 
Also, the widespread disruptions began shortly after the Southwest Airlines Pilots Association, representing 9,000 pilots, asked a federal court on Friday to block the airline's order that all employees get vaccinated. The union argued that Southwest must negotiate over the issue because it could involve sick leave or disability if pilots have a reaction to the vaccine. So this just so happened to happen when the Pilots Association for Southwest was trying to block a vaccine mandate and we had all of these cancellations and all of these things going on with air traffic control and Southwest said, oh, it was Florida weather and that the two things happened at the same time were purely coincidence and is an anti-vaxxer conspiracy theory. Okay. That's a little sus. The, the association itself denies any claims that it had a connection to the cancellation and delays, but all that means is that they didn't come together and organize things. It doesn't mean that that's why people weren't coming to work. And we have across multiple industries in the U.S. right now, people saying that they are going to quit that they're not going into work, that they're going to resign over vaccine mandates. We have people getting put on suspensions and unpaid leave. We're seeing that in healthcare, we are seeing it in law enforcement. I just heard to today that there's, an, a, there's a distinct possibility that the Chicago Police Department is going to shut down over a vaccine mandate. Can you imagine if Chicago doesn't have cops for even a day? The carnage that, that will cause? I mean, we are seeing it across so many industries of people refusing these vaccine mandates. And Southwest says, no, it's the weather in Florida. It's a little fishy. Um, and we also had, um, it's not listed on here, but at one point, the CEO or Southwest actually even came out and made a public statement saying that he personally is against vaccine mandates, but that Joe Biden forced his hand, which isn't really true because remember the Joe Biden mandate is for federal contractors, which you could argue, um, I, I think might actually encompass airlines. I'm not entirely sure how all of that works, but the um the the mandate via OSHA like hasn't actually been created yet. It's it's not a thing yet. We have a lot of corporations and big businesses that are jumping to comply with it before it actually becomes an OSHA rule. But as of right now, there is no actual OSHA mandate or those private companies where he said like private companies with a hundred or more employees. That's not a real thing yet. And Southwest is like, oh, hey, well, um, Joe Biden tied our hands with that. I'm actually going to see if I can find it. Um, Southwest CEO, uh, we'll say a vaccine statement. Let's see if we can actually pull it up. Uh, here we go, actually. This is from CNBC. Here we go. Southwest CEO says he never wanted a COVID vaccine mandate, but Biden forced his hand. He says, I've never been in favor of corporations imposing that kind of a mandate. I'm not in favor of that. However, he said that the Dallas-based carrier is complying with federal rules put in place by the Biden administration and that the objective is health and safety. So he said this uh, in an interview on Squawk on the Street. He said the executive order from President Biden mandates that all federal employees and then all federal contractors, which covers all the major airlines, have to have a vaccine mandate in place by December 8th. So we're working through that. So this was in response to talking about all of the cancellations and everything going on at Southwest. So you have all of these cancellations and delays at Southwest. You have Southwest 
and Legacy Media saying that it's purely because of weather in Florida, yet you have actual pilots and things saying that it's because of vaccine mandates. You have it all happening starting on the same day that the Pilots Association is trying to block the vaccine mandate, and then you have a statement from the CEO saying, in response to all of this, that he's against the vaccine mandate, but that Joe Biden forced his hand, and yet... This is somehow nothing to do with vaccine mandates. Really? Really? I mean, this is proof that these people think that we're stupid. (laughs) Southwest said last week that it's 56,000 employees needed to be vaccinated against COVID by December 8th in order to keep working at the airline under the federal mandate. So again... Joe Biden does his little mandate, did he? Southwest, last week, says, yep, you have to be vaccinated, and then all hell breaks loose. But it is Florida man and Florida weather. And yet, according to some of these news outlets, it's an anti-vaxxer conspiracy theory, and everything just happened to fall exactly in place at exactly the right time to crush the airline industry, basically. <laughs> and so that, that's, that's the short version, that's the TLDR version of everything that's going on with Southwest. I have heard rumors that Southwest is now backing down because of all of the issues that this has caused, but I don't know if that's actually true. If they're saying it's because of uh, the federal contractor mandate, I don't really see they would have to fight this in the courts, and surely they're not going to be the only ones fighting this in the courts, but that is uh, the story with all of this right now. Um, And it's funny because the Washington Post specifically blames the rumors that it had to do with vaccines on Tucker Carlson. (laughs) But, I mean, that's the Washington Post for you, right? All right, I see that we had um, a few more Super Chats come in. Uh, Mr. Rover Pilot says, please define ethnic studies, dare I say, if the ethnicity of native Swedes were studied, it would be accepted, right? Asking for a friend. Unlikely. Uh, Bruce the Boss says, if you think that, uh, if you think Southwest would be the biggest vax result as of midnight tonight, oh, here we go. 50% of Chicago's cops will be fired over the jab. Imagine the shootings. I am so fucking glad I don't live in Chicago right now. I will just put it at that. That is terrifying. Um, and uh, Cabled41 says, I heard the other day that 40% of the goods shipped into the U.S. come through California, which I have long suspected is the real money and power in California. Here's some diaper money. Thank you for the diaper money. Indeed. And uh, Robert Graham has upgraded his membership. Well, thank you, Robert, for that. (laughs) Um, So enjoy all your fun emojis there. There will be more. Um, YouTube puts a limit on how many new emojis I can add based on how many members there are to the channel. So I think I've hit uh, enough to get the next tier. I see Tada already used his little, uh, their little Liberty Dago there but yeah so it'll be uh it'll be interesting to see what chicago looks like this week especially i mean if 50 percent of them are being fired tonight the weekends are always awful in chicago so that's um that's going to be quite interesting anyways so uh i did it i covered all of the topics and then some a little bit tonight so that is some fun stuff so um i believe that is it for tonight uh, again yeah, mike fawish says the same i heard that all first responders are cut tonight at 12 a.m in chicago and now everybody's doing liberty dago liberty dago i made them myself i'm so proud of myself 
I was so excited. <laughs> so all of you guys uh, that have joined the channel, make sure that you check on the little community tab. There will be a post that was accidentally public for like 10 minutes yesterday morning, which explained a lot why so many people suddenly showed up in the Discord, but it is now members only. Uh, so if you go and check the community tab, there will be a link to the Discord and uh, you can sign up for Discord and be added to the Discord server if you don't already have an account. And um, once you get in there, if your name on Discord is different than what it is on YouTube, just let me know via email or like tag me in Discord, send me a message, whatever, let me know so I can make sure that you have the right access to the right things. And I see that we have a request for a baby bump before the night ends. So I will do the baby bump. I'm in a regular men's size small t-shirt today so it doesn't have quite the effect that uh, actual maternity shirts have but as of 30 as of midnight tonight because then it'll be Saturday will we be 32 weeks so we will have eight weeks to go and that is it so let's see if I can get this here we go this is the uh, 32 week belly here wait in a minute to see how it shows up make sure I'm like in frame yeah, it doesn't have quite the same effect when it's uh, the t-shirt, the men's t-shirt, but there we go. Big ol' belly. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, she partied for a solid three hours in there yesterday. <laughs> Alright guys, so... um. Thanks everyone who joined the channel during this. And we even got some new like regular subscribers too. That's pretty sweet. Thank you for everyone for the uh, super chats and uh, the donations for the diaper fund and all of that. And yes, ta-da, I know it's st still not that big. I actually have only um, gained 22 pounds and it is all baby bump. <laughs> <laughs> so uh and uh thank you for the mods everyone who donated the folks over at patreon subscribe star all of that fun stuff uh everyone for the likes shares all of that fun stuff i think that i think that's i think that's the list of people that i thank um dave simmons says which discord channel so the discord right now is only for folks that are on Patreon, Subscribestar, um, the members, or people who subscribe through the website right now. Because um, we're going to see how it goes first. I might decide to make some parts of it public eventually, but I'm not really sure right now. For right now, like I think it's a, a nice little thing um, for those folks to have. And uh, we'll see how it goes. But I have to be over on my D&D &D call right now because that was supposed to actually start at 8.45. Whoops. So thanks again, everyone. And um, I will see you in the next live stream or the next video, whichever comes first. Hopefully the next video <laughs> is what comes first. Everyone have a good weekend. And if you live in Chicago, good luck. <laughs> so... Everyone, uh, stay safe, and I'll see you next week. Bye.